Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 110, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. And I've got a feeling there will be some rather depressed ladies in the retro gaming community this week and maybe a few depressed men as well, because... Someone's got a big announcement this week, haven't they? Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> I, I was wondering what was going on then. Um, yeah, I'm engaged. Oh, for who? I'm, Ravi, congratulations. I'm going to have to um, get re- as many retro things as I can before I get married and then you'll get chucked out. <laughs> well, obviously, last year was, uh, you know, Joe and I both got married last year. You didn't want to be the odd one out, did you? No, no, you thought it'd never happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations. Cheers, man, cheers, man. So I need to top the Amiga 3000 as a wedding present then, do I? Yeah, that's it. Well, well, stag- well, you're the best man, Dan. Anyway, oh, yeah, exactly. You just asked me before. Thank you very much. Yeah. I've got the stag do to plan now, then, have I? Oh, God, it's not yet. Come on, <laughs> I've just got engaged. It's not like he's already buying yeah. the beers. <laughs> yeah, so uh, any suggestions on where we should take Ravi for his stag do? Bear in mind, we're talking Ravi Abbott here, so the sleazier the better. Yeah, uh, please just tweet your suggestions at Retro Hour UK. Congratulations, oh, big Cheers, man. Mate. Impressed. Thank you. Now, we have got a really good show planned for you this week. Um, we've kind of covered before. Um, companies kind of making games for classic systems, but these guys we've got on this week, uh, they're a team from Bitmap Bureau. Yeah, and they've they've kind of come full circle, haven't they? Because they've got Hank Nyborg is like one of the best pixel artists. Like his work that he did, Lionheart, Flink, you know, Adventures of Lomax. This was like late in the kind of Amiga life and uh, Sega life. Yeah, as Mega well. Drive as well. Yeah, yeah, but it was really, really high end pixel art. You know. Now, they're making this new game at the moment that kind of takes inspiration from... I mean, we, we've looked at the Kickstarter. Reminds me a bit of, like, Chaos Engine. And uh, Zombies Ain't My Neighbours as well, that kind of running around. A bit and, yeah. of Smash TV in there as yeah. well. And it's called Xeno Crisis. And uh, they put this up on Kickstarter. They only wanted £20,000 uh, for it, and it raised 72000 Yeah. So there's a <laughs> massive it. demand for this. And they're going to be bringing it out on the Mega Drive's 30th anniversary, a bit later yeah, on this Good year. timing, isn't it? Which I can't believe the Mega Drive's 30 this year for a start. Oh God, yeah. That is nuts. So uh, we're going to get the story of making new Mega Drive games. And it's coming out on the Dreamcast as well, actually, isn't it? Yeah, coming out on the Switch as well. It's coming out on Steam. It's coming out on everything, pretty much. So we'll find out how they got involved with, obviously, Hank being a legendary pixel artist. Kind of what the approach is to making games for classic systems in 2018. And the guys from Bitmap Bureau are going to be our special guests on the Retro Hour podcast in around 20 minutes from now. Of course, we do this show week in, week out. I think it's fair to say we have a pretty good following after doing the show for two years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we've, we've built it up, which is good. We had two years, you know, it's a long time to come in and do a show week in, week out. We love doing this. Oh, yeah, totally. And the reason that we can continue doing it and pay for stuff like our website hosting, our SoundCloud subscriptions, all our podcast services, get to events like Play Expo, is that thanks very much to you guys, our very generous donators. Now, obviously, we do say this every week when we mention it. It is completely optional. We understand that not everyone has the money or wants to pay, which is completely fine. But obviously, it's always nice if we get a bit of helping hand into the running of the show. So. Yeah, and running of the show also kind of means backstage stuff that you guys don't see, which is like the development of the new website and yeah. other big projects that can happen so there's some exciting stuff coming which you've been working on recently uh, new website looking pretty good actually yeah, I, think, yeah. uh, I can't wait to see that and uh, obviously the new website and the current one does have a link on there if you'd like to make a donation into the running of the show any amount big or small it all goes back into the running of the Retro Hour podcast and allows us to keep coming in doing this every week for you guys and also bringing you these top quality guests week in week out and I know you've been working very hard and getting some uh, pretty big names lined up for the next few oh, weeks. Oh, yeah, we've got we've got some awesome names. It's going to be amazing. Well, speaking of awesome names, let's mention the people who made the Hall of Fame this week and made a donation into the running of the show. Uh, thank you so much to Michael Stouffs. Helga Blystad. Eamon Murphy. And Gary Audley. Who all made donations into the running of the show. You can do the same. We've got a PayPal button, or you can just leave a little donation by cryptocurrency if you're into that. Yeah. Uh, on our website, the link's at the front page of the retrohour.com. Now, we were talking a few weeks ago on the show about this fan movie that's been made all about Goldeneye, the N64 classic. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we talked about it and they said, thank you so much for picking up this project because no one else has really covered it. They got in touch. Yeah, yeah. And they sent us a screener of it. And I'm not going to send it to everybody. <laughs> we've, we've had a nice look. And it is one of the funniest kind of video game films I've seen. Like, the, the quality of the acting in it is absolutely fantastic. And it's also got that real sick kind of gross-out British humour stuff. Right, okay. You know, when when situations are awkward or something's just really, like, oh, cringeworthy, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was watching this with my girlfriend, and she, at points, 
she was going, ah! You know, it was it was like one of these films that you actually react to in it. Watching it through your fingers kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. and like, I don't mean to be down on video game you, films that have come out before and stuff, but this one has a storyline. and okay. It's an actual kind of one way you're like, come on, go for it. And, and the crazy thing is as well, you, you, you're backing the characters in it, but... A lot of the guys in it are originally from the Golden Eye team. Right. And they're acting really well in it. So <laughs> you've got the original developers and they're like playing great roles and they're very funny in this. What's this movie called? It's called Going for Golden Eye. Okay. Um this is it's an in- independent movie. Yeah, it's an independent movie and the kind of idea of the movie is that there's a set of characters that were these uh, you know, Golden Eye legends back in the days and yeah. uh then it's kind of gone slower and there's less people attending and it's kind of gone from 2,000 people in a big hall to like 10 <laughs> in a bedroom. But they're still doing the GoldenEye competition, but there's certain stuff like the signs printed wrong and yeah. GoldenEye spelt wrong. And, you know, they're always trying to get extra people and it never happens. And uh, this kind of school rivalry then interplays into it and there's a whole thing about kind of defeating your enemies and your bullies and it gets pretty ridiculous, but... <laughs> also has that really good feel of lads sitting around playing GoldenEye. And you know when you did that big kill on GoldenEye. Oh, best feeling ever. Yeah, and they've got some great concepts. Like, they must be real, real big fans of it. You know, like all the really bad guns in it and stuff mm. and all the certain moves and the characters to pick. They they know exactly what they're talking about in it. And is this film released yet then, or is it? I don't think it's released yet. They're, they're in the kind of final stages of editing. So the copy that I saw was as good enough to come out. You yeah, know? okay. And it's going to come out on Blu-ray, DVD, and also video on demand, so you may be able to stream it on certain services. Fantastic. Well, well, we'll put a link in this week's show notes at com if you want to have a look at that film. It's always good to see like passionate projects about games that we loved. Totally, um, and when they're funny, it's just like a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's very hit and miss, isn't it? You know, it's... Often you can get people that maybe not experienced comedy writers. It's quite hard to do, actually, yeah. comedy. So it's uh, yeah, definitely an achievement. So I look forward to watching it as well. Yeah, watch out for the dad. He's hilarious. Now, speaking of comedy, have you heard of a game called Hong Kong 1997? No, I haven't. Uh, it sounds like a, a kind of unofficial title there, doesn't it? Well, this was a game that I know you often hear the title, you know, the worst video game of all time. Well, Angry Video Game Nerd did a video on this maybe a year, two years ago now that kind of got, you know, a lot, a lot of people interested in this I game. I remember the Action 52 one. It was a bit after that he did okay. this. But the, the idea of this game is, um, let me tell you the, the story of the game. So as Britain transfers sovereignty over the territory to China and the tanks roll in, so do the Chinese in huge numbers, causing the crime rate in Japan to soar. Former British Governor Chris Patton engages undercover operative Chin, who's a long-lost relative of Bruce Lee, who looks just like Jackie Chan. God. <laughs> and his mission is to kill all, all one billion of those, in quotes, ugly reds. Oh, my God. So this game was completely unofficial. It is absolutely abysmal, but it's got scanned-in pictures of, like, Jackie Chan in the game as the character. There's actually dead body appears in the game at God, one point as well. It, it sounds terribly racist as well. It, it is, you know. extremely. And it's got this music going all the way through the game on a loop. It's, this is the creation of a madman, isn't it? <laughs> so, so why is this in the news, then? Well, this game, it came out unofficially. It never got a release on cartridge. Instead, it was just brought out on the Super Nintendo disc system. You know, the floppy disc? That you oh, yeah, for God, it? that was just in Japan then, wasn't I'm it? I'm going to keep yeah. this going now for like the rest of the time. <laughs> <No. laughs> we'll get rid of that. Uh, but the guy that made it, he made it in 1995, and no one had really heard from him since. Now, recently, uh, the South China Morning Post have realised quite how infamous this game has become, and they tracked down the original developer, and his name is, uh, I'm going to try and pronounce this right, Koshisha Kurosawa, and he's actually done the first interview in 20 years about this game. Is he like, head in hands? Well, he said the reason he's done an interview is to get people to finally shut up about this game once and for all. <laughs> he's sick of hearing about it. He said he reckons he made this game intentionally bad to be an abysmal video game. He said he looked at Nintendo games and they're all that slick and polished. He wants to do something the complete opposite and do the worst game ever. Well, now he's done an interview. Everyone's going to be talking about it. We're covering it. <laughs> well, he said he gets about 10 messages on Facebook every day, people God. asking him about it, and he, he ignores them all. He's sick of hearing about the yeah, game yeah. now. But then, because not many people have found this game, there's only like a leaked ROM that you can play online. There is a YouTuber called 
ultra-healthy video game nerd who claims to have tracked down the original floppy disk version of this, and he's done a video. He doesn't mention where he got the disk from, but he shows it running and kind of does like an unboxing of it and stuff as well on this channel. So, like you said, you know, if this guy's aim was to get this game forgotten about, it's actually made the headlines on at least three retro gaming sites this week. Yeah, so. it's going to be talked about more than ever. It's going to it's going to become a rare title that people will start buying for ten thousand pounds. I think we need to wait till Ashens gets hold of a copy of it and puts it in his next book. A terrible old racist game. <laughs> <laughs> you never want to play. Yeah. Now, something else has been all over the headlines this week. Obviously, Elon Musk, he's been making the headlines everywhere because of the Tesla in space a oh, couple yeah. of weeks ago. Well, well, he's been in space before, and this is, um, he was actually a kind of old video game programmer, now, a, a low-level coder. He used to work on video games back in the, in the 90s then, so I didn't well, know Well, even Elon in the 80s, up okay. to 84, he was working for a South African tech company. Right. This is quite good. He was 12 years old, and he got paid 500 quid to make a game called Blastar, and you can actually play it online. Okay. At the moment, HTML5. Looks a bit like a, yeah, an old-school shoot-em-up game, isn't it? Yeah, and he says, you know, uh, this game makes good use of sprites and animation, and in this sense, it makes the listings worth reading, you know? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so he's, he's 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 experimented and played around, and they said, you know, he was a bit of a, a low-level coder, but he also worked on a few PlayStation titles as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking here at the, the list of games. Like you said, I mean, he had a very short kind of forgotten career in video games, and it was mainly low-level code that he did. He wasn't, like, designing games or, you know, coming up with concepts or graphics or anything. But one of them he did work on was a game called Rocket Jockey. Now, that came out in 1996. I thought, where, where do I know that title from? I looked at it, and actually, I do remember seeing that game. It was. you kind of on this, like, kind of powered kind of ski thing, like sleigh okay. thing or something. <laughs> and it's um, it's kind of a destruction kind of game. And it, lo- it was actually lots of fun from what I remember. But another game that he, he worked on, too, is Cadillacs and Dinosaurs. It was a uh, Mega CD game. And that was actually a bit of a forgotten classic on the Mega CD. I'm looking at this article here on Kotaku. A lot of people are saying, you know, I'd completely forgotten about um, that game. And also Rocket Jockey. People are saying that they should reboot it. And bring it's those amazing games back. how many people in technology have been in the computer game making world. And the thing about this was, they said with Elon Musk, anything that they'd chuck at him, he'd, yeah. be, he'd, he'd kind of be into it. And, uh, you know, he's completely unflappable. And they said after a short while... Uh, I don't think anyone was giving him direction. He just ended up making what he wanted. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, maybe we've got a, a, a Tesla prototype game that's somewhere there. Well, that's the thing about, we hear so many stories from interviewees that we have on about often how the video games industry is a bit like that, especially back then. Mm. It was kind of like, because it was such a new industry, no one really knew what they were doing, so it was kind of make it up as you go along. Uh, but obviously, I think there is a lot of creativity in video games. So obviously, it did maybe spark some imagination in him and... Uh, might, you know, maybe he would have been doing something different today if he didn't get into those games that he worked on back in the day. Well, we'll have to get him on one day and ask, won't we? That's your job for this week then, Ravi, okay? Yeah, okay. Expect okay. him on next week. <laughs> Good luck. Look, look out on Twitter for the big announcement. <laughs> now, if you want to get hold of some classic games, we know the best place to do that is obviously at um, Retro Gaming Markets. Yeah, because you don't have to pay for the postage. And, <laughs> and you, you can see them in person. You can see them in person and see what condition it's in. Not kind of wait for eBay <laughs> for it to turn up and then do a bad you know, commentary on someone. Well, there is a really big one. that We talked about this last year. We didn't actually make it up to it, but I had some really good reports about it. And uh, at the time the show comes out, it's happening next weekend. And that is the uh, Doncaster video game market. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's really reasonable, actually. Um, two pounds entry. Okay. If you want to be early bird and get all those bargains early, it's only four pounds. And that's just pay on the door. I'm looking at the list of uh, people that are here as well. There's a lot of companies that are going to be attending this. Hell of a lot of traders, actually. And this is probably the reason why we haven't gone down, because we will be absolutely <laughs> broke if we came out of this, wouldn't we? Uh, Console Passion are going to be there. Sore Thumbs Retro Games, Retro Plushy Games, The Retro Hunter. I mean, I'm scrolling down here. There's about eight, nine pages worth yeah, of people going to be Yeah, it's just like there. retailers for all different kinds of consoles, you know. that It's, it's family-friendly as well. And uh, it's absolutely mental and rammed, I've heard. Like, I've heard it's about three layers deep of people or four layers. I'm looking at the pictures here as well. There's, there's even, like, you know, magazine retailers there, and there are system setups so you can play games. And these are really good for families as well, I think. Yeah, they're really good. And, you know, we've just been to the expos and yeah. stuff. And retro is really kicking off at the moment, isn't yeah. it? We, we, we started this podcast just at the right time, I think. It's yeah. uh, really flying. And the amount of interest and the amount of trade that's going on is. Uh, pretty phenomenal some of the prices and some of the stuff that i saw there was like 
nearly a quarter more than it was last year. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I, I know, I know, I know a guy actually who's thinking of giving his job up and going into just selling retro stuff full time now. Yeah. He's earning that much off it of eBay and that kind of thing. It's crazy. Yeah. So it's, uh, but I, I think these kind of trade shows, because there, there are lots of them around the country now, and. You know, not every town can support the big kind of expo kind of stuff. But having just a, a market that comes to town where video game fans can come along and just, you know, do purchases well, and actually well, see the game. that's it. You know, we were, we were at Play Expo and it's like they had two copies of Castlevania yeah. for the NAS. And I think they were already 80 or 90 quid. And one had a missing manual and they were gone like, bam, yeah. like that. And I could imagine that next year... Castlevania is going to be about up to about <laughs> 180 or 150. That's well last year. Yeah. Let's get more in. And the Torrid Jaguar games, I cleaned them out this year, so yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll see. But yeah, if you're around Doncaster next weekend, it's absolutely worth a look in. Uh, we'll put a link in the show notes if you want to get your tickets. Happening at the Doncaster Dome on the 3rd of March 2018. Uh, opens 11am till 4pm. Uh, all the details will be in this week's show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, one of my favourite interviews that we did last year was Stuart Chaffee. Mm. Now, you remember him. He was the guy that hosted the Computer Chronicles, which I was actually watching a few of those again the other week on thrawnarchive.org. I love the music. Du, du, yeah. Du, 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 du. <laughs> yeah, it's a great show, that is. And that really captured such a unique time. You know, it was pretty much the birth of personal computing, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, really early 80s. And along with Stuart, there was a Gary Kildall. Now, obviously, people know Gary from uh, CPM, Operating System. He was a co-host on Computer Chronicles. And we heard of Stuart last year. I mean, if, if you miss that episode, I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes as well if you want to check it out. So it was a really interesting conversation. And Gary is often kind of talked about as a guy that should have been Bill Gates. Yeah, because this was, this was the kind of deciding point, wasn't it? With yeah. IBM, you had CPM on one side and you had MS-DOS. Um, MS-DOS and, that, and, and this was like... The legendary meeting with Bill Gates yeah. was around the same period that Gary was about to have a meeting with them. And that was the the kind of fortune, because the thing was, Bill Gates lied when he did that meeting. Mm -hmm. He said that he had the, the MS-DOS and he didn't actually have it. They went off and bought it off <laughs> yeah. a bloke and kind of, it was just all based on a lie and confidence. And uh, Gary had CPM, he had it all already and... This this is a, a such a big point in history because Bill Gates was, you know, the world's richest man. That that created a, a massive fortune. It was absolutely insane. Based on a lie. Based on a lie. <laughs> yeah, it was the biggest blag in history. Yeah. That one was absolutely was, and it was that legendary meeting that you know everyone always talks about this with Gary. They all say that he's a guy that could have been Bill Gates. Yeah, because Gary was so committed to um, kind of keeping his promises and stuff and uh, it was just the kind of guy he was so he'd actually promised his wife to go flying for it was, a, it was a birthday for a birthday on, on the day that Microsoft was supposed to meet with him so they cancelled it and then did a Bill Gates meeting and then that deal happened and it kind of it really affected Gary throughout his life because he uh, imagine that not happening yeah. and then you have to present this show Talking about that product. Where you're talking about <laughs> that product all the time and you can see everything. You can see the rise of how big the PC platform was getting, mm. you know. And then obviously Windows came along and, built, like you said, Bill Gates became the richest man in the world. And Gary, I mean, it's a bit of a tragic tale. He, he got into alcohol, very depressed, and actually died in a, a bar and brawl in yeah. the early 90s. Um, so the tragic tale of just how, it's a bit like the movie Sliding Doors, I guess, isn't it? Just how one little incident can change the entire course of totally. your life. Now, obviously, it's it's an interesting story, very tragic, but Stuart was a very close friend to Gary, and you know he, he often talks about him. That interview we did last year with him, he was saying just what a genuine, warm guy he was, and probably his favourite person ever. But you can see that on the TV as well. You can see when Gary's interviewing people that he's he's so warm and he's just got a nice glow. Yeah. Just seemed a really genuine guy, didn't he? Yeah. And the fact that, you know, he missed out on a meeting that could have made him the richest man in the world to treat his wife for a birthday, I think, says it all. Mm. Well, now, um, Stuart's going to do something about this and make sure that Gary's legacy is preserved. So he tweeted this out the other day. He said, um, Gary Kildall was a great friend and colleague, and in honour of Gary, I'm going to be producing a play based on his brilliant yet short and tragic life. It's going to be called The Forgotten Computer Genius. So he's going to actually be doing a play, and he's talking about maybe doing this for television as well or cinema. And that's too. that's great because Stuart has such a good good set of contacts within the television networks. Yeah. But also he was like Gary's best mate, yeah. so you know he knew him 
and work with him longer than anyone else, I think. So. Well, after we did that show, I mean, I, I tried to do a bit of research a bit more about Gary's story online. It's hard to find out a lot about it. So I think having this kind of tribute to him and making sure that he is, is remembered in future generations is really important, I think. Because if ever, anybody remembers CPM, it was great. Yeah, well, it was like, you know, before MS-DOS came along, it was kind of the standard, really. Yeah, it was, it was, it was quite visual as well before, wasn't it? Well, I remember, like, you know, the Commodore 128, that had a Z80 chip in, didn't it, so it could run CPM, you know. Mm. It was kind of industry standard, but obviously when MS-DOS came along, it kind of got swept away. So Stuart's going to be, um, it's kind of a just concept stage at the moment, but he said he's going to be doing an Indiegogo or a Kickstarter campaign um, if enough people are interested, so... We'll be definitely pushing that, and we hope that you guys can also back that Kickstarter because this story needs to be told. So obviously, the more that we're here, we'll keep you up to date on that. Uh, let's keep listening to future episodes of the Retro Hour podcast, as you should every week anyway. Oh, of course. It's a story <laughs> that needs to be told. Uh, so thank you very much for checking out episode number 110 of the Retro Hour. We'll be out again next Friday uh, from all your favourite podcast clients, download sites, YouTube, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and obviously keep those five-star reviews coming in. Really but but not it. Spotify, surprisingly. Spotify have chosen a cur- curation policy where they've decided to um, kind of pick and choose <laughs> podcasts that go on there. And I've noticed none of the UK ones are on there at all. So maybe they're just, <laughs> yeah. Ravi's rant this week is sponsored yeah. by Spotify. <laughs> yeah, but we've had people asking, you know, are you going to be on We Spotify? have, and we've tried to submit three times. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it, any- ju- it just seems to be like Adam Buxton and stuff like well, If that. anyone knows anyone at Spotify, have a word. Have a say. word, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but wherever you listen, please do check us out again next Friday. And now we're going to get some really cool memories. Uh, lots of classic talk about those old consoles and computers, but also bringing back games on the Mega Drive and the Dreamcast in 2018. How you do it, what's involved, how you get them made, is there enough interest, what's different from the old days? This week's special guest is the guys from Bitmap Bureau and we'll see you next week. Ciao. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it's time to welcome on this week's very special guests and it is the team from Bitmap Bureau. Now, I thought it might be, because we've got a few actual guests on the show this week, I thought it might be quite nice just to kind of take it in turn. So uh, we'll start with you, Mike. Introduce yourself and uh, tell us just a little bit about your background and what you do. Sure, yeah, I've I've been in the games industry for 22 years now. Uh, Started as a tester with SCI, uh, working on games like Carmageddon. And yeah, any of your listeners might recall that you spoke to Patrick Buckland a few uh, few weeks ago. Yes. So yeah, worked on his game. Um, after that, I went into making some of the very first uh, mobile games for people like Nokia and Siemens. So games like Tic Tac Toe, Snake, <laughs> very very simple black and white games. Uh, after that, I went into Flash games, uh, working with the likes of Namco, Adult Swim, Disney, uh, making. Sort of 2D pixel art games. I think our most famous one was Super House of Dead Ninjas. And um, yeah, more recently, about two years ago, I formed Bitmap Bureau with Matt. Yeah, we released 88 Heroes and Ninja Showdown uh, across all uh, modern formats. And uh, now we're working on Xeno Crisis for the Mega Drive, of course. Fantastic. Well, uh, Matt's on the line as well. Uh, Matt Cope, give us a bit about your background then, Matt. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Matt Cope. I've been probably in the games industry since the very late 90s. So so not quite as long as Mike, but sort of coming on to 20 years now. Um, yeah, jumped pretty much head on into uh, mobile game dev very early on, similar to Mike. It's how we crossed paths sort of in the early 2000s. Um, so yeah, worked on similar projects back then. Um, I made a, a little bit of a tangent probably about 10 years ago now um, with uh, cross-platform uh, software. So we were trying to get um, mobile apps working on all the different platforms. This is all like pre-iPhone um, and pre-Android. Um, and so I did that for a number of years. So I've generally worked on sort of technical programming, so very low-level stuff. And back, obviously, in the early days on the, the mobile, things were very limited. Um, so, yeah, that's my background. Then, yeah, as Mike said, a couple of years ago, got the bug back for wanting to do some games, and uh, we chatted and uh, set up Bitmap Bureau. So. Fantastic. And uh, we've also got a third member of your team on the line as well. Uh, hello, Hank. Introduce yourself and give us a bit about your background. Yes, hi there. Well, I'm Hank. Hank Nieborg, that's how you pronounce it, actually. I'm a pixel artist well, as long as I well, can remember. Let's see. 27 years professionally. I started pixeling on the 64, Commodore 64. That's about around 83, 84, I think, on Koala Painter. 
And uh, well, after what I moved to the Amiga and uh, made a little game called Lineart back in Germany, I made Flink for the Sega Mega Drive. Together with programmer Evan Kloiphofer, I made several games with him. And after that, I did Lomax for PlayStation 1. I'm not going to name all the games, of course. But it's, about, <laughs> it's around 35 or 36 games, published games, actually. And, well, I think I've pixeled and also drew graphics for, I think, almost every platform out there since the last 27 years. So now I joined while well, the circle is round again, <laughs> doing another <laughs> Sega Mega Drive game. And I'm um, well, really happy with that, by the way. And um, well, just check on my website, uh, www.henkneiborg.nl. Just, just look at my portfolio and um, you will see. Otherwise, it will ramble on for another half an hour. So, <laughs> well, what we, you know, we <laughs> established, when we started talking before the interview, this is actually the first time you guys have actually spoken with Hank um, like on, uh, on yeah. voice chat. Is that right? Yeah, well, we're actually hearing our real voices for the first time. That's kind of weird, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> Well, yeah, we've we've been uh, communicating via email for for months now, and yeah. uh, not actually met in person or spoken over, over the phone. But I guess that's how modern development is now. That you know, when you're, um, I think email is just enough. Really, you know, Hank sends, sends us a bunch of art occasionally, and <laughs> we drop it in the game. And uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's it's all works very smoothly. But yeah, it's nice to actually speak to him. Well, I'm glad we could bring you guys right. a bit closer together. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. Well, we also have to kind of get a bit of background on our guests as well. I think, you know, we might just pick on someone here. Um, we'll start with you, Mike. What was your first ever computer or gaming memory then? Can, can we go all the way back? What do you remember? I can vaguely remember my childhood. <laughs> I, I certainly remember going on holiday in Cornwall um, <laughs> and playing uh, games like Xevious and Tempest, Gradius uh, in in fish and chip shops, as we used to do back then. Um, so yeah, they used to have great arcade cabinets in random places. Um, but of course, you, you go to the seaside towns like Falmouth, and they'd have great arcades there as well. So um, yeah, I grew up playing some pretty hardcore games. Actually, when you look back, you know, games were pretty harsh back then, and they uh, they certainly ate through your money. My first computer was a weirdly, it was a Amstrad PC fifteen twelve uh, back when I was eleven. Uh, I know my parents had to get a loan, I think, to to buy it, and it took like ten years to pay off. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I really loved that machine and played games like um, Starflight, Ultima, uh, some of the bitmap private stuff as well. Actually, like uh, Speedball, Bar's Tale, uh, Sci-Fi Trading Company, um, and yeah, I used to also go to a lot of my friends had computers. You know, I, I think I had weirdly had a, a friend, at least one friend with each kind of machines. So I had a friend with a Commodore 64, a friend with a Spectrum, a friend with a BBC Micro, a CPC. And yeah, we always, always used to cycle around each other's houses and just play each other's games all the time. Eventually I got into consoles and the first console was the Mega Drive when I was about 12, 13. Uh, yeah, I'm still a big fan of uh, to this day. Uh, and yeah, after that I got very much into collecting uh, weird Japanese games and consoles. So I got the Super Famicom, the Neo Geo, PC Engine, even like the PCFX and Super Graphics as well. Still, a, still an avid collector. Not that I can afford it anymore. But I, yeah, yeah, actually being able to make a Mega Drive game yeah makes up for not being able to <laughs> collect all the games that I'd like to. Well, Matt, I was wondering what was your favourite system back then. That's a difficult one. The first one I ever had was probably a Nintendo Game Boy. I remember just like they arrived at school. I was probably eight or nine. Everyone sort of seemed to have them before Christmas. And then I spent like the whole of Christmas, my birthday in January, just like saving hard and trying to convince aunts and uncles to give me the cash so I could buy this Nintendo Game Boy. So uh, I got very hooked on that and then uh, went on to other consoles uh, after that. But it's, that's very fond of my heart. But actually, probably the thing I recall most from my childhood is actually um, a particular arcade, Street Fighter 2, um, at the local leisure centre. And I hate to think how much pocket money I put in that machine, but that's always been the the one that sort of uh, the fond memories are from. Well, Hank, I mean, we've heard a bit about the games that you were you were making and you've worked on over the last few decades. But kind of going back to you know your, your when you first got into video games, were there any like fond memories that you have, or any any games that you used to really be hooked on back when you were a kid? It all started with the arcade machines, of course, like Defender, Scramble, and Galaction and stuff like that. I've seen stuff like that release when it came out. If you know what I mean, that's how old I am. And uh, well, they also were standing at a local cafeteria, like the fish and chips shop, if you know what I mean. And um, 
later on, I uh, while well, my dad brought home this Philips Odyssey game system, and I was asleep. I just oh, what, what what kind of noise am I hearing in the living room? I just that's when I really first discovered well introduction to a home system really. And uh, after that, um, a couple of years later, I just bought myself an Atari twenty six hundred. And so on, and so on, and so on. And my first home computer was Atari 600XL, but I discovered later that it was a kind of a mistake, so I bought a Commodore 64. Those were the really fond memories, really the, the, the early days, just playing the games in the arcades, really discovering new in, invented stuff, if you know what I mean. I mean, they were, disco- they were actually inventing new games back then. It was quite, quite what a hell of an experience. That yeah, I'm with, I'm with Hank there, really, yeah. I don't get that same buzz. Uh, that I used to when I was, you know, in my early teens and, uh, well, even before that. Um, yeah, it just feels like uh, there, there isn't as much innovation now. I mean, maybe we've, yeah, I, I think so many genres have been created over the last 10, 20 years that it's, it's very hard to create something new now, I guess. Well, Mike, I was wondering how you actually got into the games industry then. Yeah, pretty lucky, really. Um, so I was at college when I was 19, um, wasn't sure what to do. I was studying uh, graphical communication, which is pretty much illustration, really. Uh, spent my whole time drawing Street Fighter Two characters. <laughs> but, um, I, um, I'm sure you remember Edge magazine. Yeah. Uh, but there was a company called uh, Aardvark Swift, who are still going, actually. Um, famous recruitment company. And they were advertising for... Actually, I think they were just people who wanted to get into the games industry. So I wrote to them. Mm-hmm. And somehow they found me a testing job in Southampton, which was just a you know, half-hour bus ride from where I lived. Um, and yeah, I remember going to SDI. I didn't know how to prepare for this job interview. So I took my um, PlayStation memory card with all my Ridge Racer times on it. <laughs> and nice. um, I pretty much turned up and, uh, yeah, as soon as they saw me with the memory card, I don't think they even looked at the time. So they just said, yeah, you've got the job pretty much. <laughs> so, so that was cool. Um, but I do remember them asking me, be okay testing terrible games yeah you know, every day of your life and i sort of laughed it off but um this week i was almost ready to quit really it was <laughs> it's yeah it sounds like a great job but when you're playing a video game eight hours a day five six seven days a week even a very good one you know you're going to get quite sick of it uh, quickly and um but yeah i stuck with it and made it to where i am now so you made an interesting point there because a friend of mine actually did some um, game testing for Sega. And I remember we all thought that was the best job in the world, but he did it for about about a month and he hated it by the end. He used to put him on like the night shift and he played games all night and it was like free pizza, uh, you know, free Coke, free popcorn. But yeah, he just he didn't want to play any games after uh, about three days of doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they did that to us as well. They'd um, give us overtime and I remember doing a 24-hour shift testing Carmageddon uh, 8 player. <laughs> um yeah, towards the end of development. And yeah, I remember some substances going around the office as well. <laughs> it was an um, interesting time. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think um, most testers will probably tell you it does kind of jade you. But um, luckily it gave me the, the opportunities to get into t- uh, level design and game design and then games programming. So yeah, I managed to escape tests luckily, which is uh, definitely a good thing. Well, let's talk a bit about Bitmap Bureau because um, it's a fascinating project that you know these games that you guys are working on. We'll obviously get more into the games in just a moment, but how was it founded and why was it needed? Um, yeah, honestly, it was, it was kind of uh, I'd uh, been out of the games bit for quite a while. Came back to Mike just so I think I just bumped into your office, didn't I? Just and sort of said, "Oh, how hey, doing? What are you up to?" Saw some of the games I've been working on. Um, and then as it transpired, there was an opportunity to join forces again, set up a new studio, um, and we went for it, really. And I think for Mike at the time, uh, moving from – you could see the uh, the end was nigh for Flash, um, or, or it's probably already pretty much over. So it was all about um, Steam, PC consoles, and uh, other devices. So uh, I knew from a technical side I could supply that piece of the puzzle, and Mike could supply the uh, – gameplay and creativity uh, from that angle. So really, yeah, that was kind of back in battery. Well, um, were you kind of seeing a change in the scene at the time, like um, a, a look back at these old pixel titles and uh, adding new features? No, it's just a change in seeing in the pixel titles. I just think generally indie development has massively increased in the last few years. Um, obviously, the tools have got better, so the likes of Unity and things like that. Um, the entry level to creating high quality games has really changed. Um, so you've seen a massive rush to the various platforms and stores that you've never seen sort of previously. It's been 
I sort of uh, Mike and Hink are describing is very unique back 20, 30 years ago, but it's very mainstream now. So, um, yeah, I think what that left us with is a sort of reminiscing uh, on the, uh, what we really enjoyed of our youth. And so we definitely wanted to have our angle being very specifically the old style retro game sort of feel. That was really important to us from the day one. Well, Hank, you're one of the kind of original pixel artists. Did you ever think that you would be doing pixels again in 2017? No, I was just thinking of that, actually. I mean, when you would have asked me 25 years ago that I would still be doing this in 25 years, and I wouldn't have believed it. That's also because of, well, it's somehow timeless when you do it right, if you know what I mean. In the mid-90s, everything had to be 3D for a couple of years, didn't it? No one would accept yeah, no. 3D artwork. Yeah, the thing is, um, I still remember when doing Lomax for the PlayStation 1, we, we didn't get any attention for the game. Also, when we, well, for magazines or whatsoever, because everybody was expecting this this awful 3D. Well, back then it was awful. awful. And, um, yeah, that was a little bit frustrating, to be honest. I thought, well, this is it for pixeling. So also, I think I also didn't pixel for a year or so after that, after Lomax was complete. Trying to get into 3D, just you can't force anyone into 3D if you know doesn't really feel like. Well, I absolutely love your kind of art style, and I'd say you did very particularly beautiful pieces. Like Lion Art, Lionheart for me was just such a beautiful Amiga title, and it was just yeah, thank you. Same with yeah, Flink as well. It made made quite a big step from well, my the, the game before that was Ghost Battle, and it was just well somehow a mixed bag of everything I liked <laughs> from Green Beret to Ghouls and Ghosts, favorite horror movies. And then well, also the pixel quality between Ghost Battle and Line Art is it's quite a big step. And also one of the first games where I really started looking at other artists, or I mean, real traditional artists like the Vincent Segrel and the Boris Vallejo. That was the stuff he looked at. And, and you can also see it in Line Art that it looked really well at their work. I tried to translate that to pixels and onto the Amiga, and um, people still love it, apparently. <laughs> yeah, and it, it was very defined and different from the Japanese pixel style. The yeah. uh, European pixel style yeah. had its own definition, you know? Yeah, some, some people try to copy the Japanese style, but, well, that's kind of stupid, isn't it? I mean, I'm from Europe, so I'm just drawing it my way. And I kind of developed my own style throughout the years and people just recognize my stuff and that's quite uh, well, flattering, to be honest. Well, while we're talking about your classic stuff, Hank, I mean, uh, Flink was a game that had particularly detailed graphics. I remember seeing that on the uh, Amiga CD32 yeah. and the Sega Mega CD. What was the story yeah. behind that game then and how, how did you get involved in that? Well, actually, after, um, well, I worked for Thalion. We did, we did um, line out for Thalion back in Germany. Me and uh, Evan Kloipo for the programmer of Lionheart. And, uh, well, we knew this Italian was coming to an end so, for somehow, so for some reason. And we just wrote a couple of letters and included Lionheart in it to Electronic Arts and Psychnosis and all these kind of companies. So a couple of weeks later, we were invited by um, Psychnosis. And, uh, well, with the plans to do another Amiga game, and they were, of course, interested. And they wrote together this quick concept in half an hour. This was Flink, actually. And they offered us to do it for the Sega Mega Drive instead. So, well, that was pretty much a dream come true to develop for a console, especially back then. So I just gave everything, all the best I had. And, well, the result was Flink in the end. I never really understood why the quality of most of the graphics from back, back in those days on the Mega Drive weren't that high because you could really... Pull off some really nice stuff, especially when you're um, from the Amiga platform. Well, Mike and Matt, how did you guys get to know about Hank's work then? I mean, did you play his classic games and how did you guys hook up? Yeah, I mean, uh, Hank is um, synonymous with pixel art. Yeah, his head's going to get really big here. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone, yeah, if you talk about pixel art, um, certainly the first name that comes into my head is Hank Nyborg, Nyborg sorry. Uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, I, you know, I remember uh, Lomax and, and Flink very well. And he also works on Contra 4 and Shantai. Uh, Harry Potter, some other great games. So um, yeah, I mean, when it when the concept of making a Mega Drive game came about, we obviously needed to find uh, someone with Mega Drive experience, and ideally uh, a, a great pixel artist as, as well. Um, 
And I thought, uh, I imagined Hank would be far too busy with uh, Way Forward and companies like that to, to even bother entertaining us. But um, yeah, we, we sent him an email and um, obviously he's, uh, he, he went for it. So and it's great to be working with him. What did appeal to you about joining the team then, Hank? Well, first of all, it was a Mega Drive game. Well, they offered me another game as well, but um, it's just a feeling, I think. When I first read uh, any offer, it's just a feeling. And you're just, um, well, and the opportunity to do another Mega Drive game was just too good to be true, actually. And later on, I just, uh, well, working with those guys is also incredible, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not kidding. I've, okay. been used, I've, I've been used to quite a few um, indie developers and, uh, well, can be strange, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and uh, well, you guys are just professionals. That's all I can say. Ah, oh, cheers, Hank. Yeah, well, you, you, haven't seen, you haven't seen our office, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke on you, mate. <laughs> I'm sat in it right now. It's pretty, uh, pretty untidy. <laughs> the, I mean, the, you guys are professionals. You see, well, you see, I see what you, what you guys can do. So, Well, I've heard that before. <laughs> the, the, apparently, the messier the office, the more creative the, the team, apparently. If I only think... that true. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, my front room's the same. <laughs> well, one thing I'm quite interested in, obviously, you know, back in the old days, I imagine software like D-Paint was like kind of the de facto for make, making pixel art. What kind of yeah. tools do you use today, and how does it differ? Pretty much something that looks like D-Paint, and it's called uh, Promotion from uh, Cosmigo. And it's, it's a window-based D-Paint, actually. It works in the same way, but just lots of extra features, of course. And, um, well, for some color tweaking, I use a very old version of Photoshop, and that's pretty much it. Being an indie dev, does that kind of give you more freedom than the other guys? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess you can go and make whatever you like, but um, yeah, whether a publisher will pick it up or whether people want to play it, it's, you just never know, really. Um, that's the nice thing about Kickstarter. I guess you can put up a project in its sort of infancy and see if there's a market for it. And yeah, that turned out to be uh, the case for Xeno Crisis. We've made all sorts of weird games for Flash and Steam. Some have worked out, some haven't. Um, very much a, a gamble, it seems, and just having the right game in the right place at the right time. I wouldn't have it any other way, and I, I wouldn't. I can't imagine going back to a uh, AAA development. Uh, well, I'm far too old for that now, anyway. But, <laughs> but yeah, I'm very happy being a, an, an indie dev. What extra features and kind of cool new modern stuff have you put into your games? Xeno Crisis in particular. Um, well, compared to... Mega Drive games of old, uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, procedural generation and randomization, so that was one thing we were very keen to get in there. Um, I think the quality of Hank's work as well, really, you know, if you compare that to pretty much anything from the 90s, you know, it, it's, it's head and shoulders above most games. But also working with uh, Savage Regime, who's a fantastic chip tune mus musician, and he's pushing the, uh, the YM2612 chip to its absolute limit, and he's uh, come up with some amazing music. But yeah, um, we're also trying to innovate in terms of gameplay. Obviously, it's a top-down arena shooter, so it's not going to, yeah, it's not going to be winning any prizes for originality. But um, we're trying to include some interesting enemies and boss fights. So um, yeah, it should appeal to to a lot of Mega Drive gamers, we think, and yeah, people outside of the uh, retro crowd as well. I mean, if people haven't been following Xeno Crisis, it actually, I'm looking at the video now on your website, and like you said, it, it, it kind of reminds me of those classic top-down shooters, stuff like um, Chaos Engine and Smash TV. I mean, was there much influence from those kind of games? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think Smash TV was the template, really. I'm a big fan of, uh, well, pretty much all Williams games, but uh, yeah, Smash TV was, was a great game, and Mega Drive uh, conversion was pretty decent. Um, but it might sound a bit bullish, but I, I felt like we could improve a bit on Smash TV by adding new elements. Obviously, it was a, an arcade game, and arcade games are made very differently to console games. So yeah, with with Xeno Crisis, we've been able to uh, sort of flesh out the concepts a bit a bit more, I think. Um, but yeah, uh, other games like Mercs, uh, Shock Troopers on the Neo Geo is a great game that we've had a good look at. Uh, then there's Zombies Ate My Neighbors, Granada, Berserk, if you want to go further back than, than the likes of Robotron. Uh, yeah, we've, we've had a good look at shooters from the 80s and 90s and hopefully pick the best elements and combine them into something special. Well, Matt, you know, I was wondering in, in 2018, 
making a Sega Mega Drive game, I mean, what kind of kit do you use? Is it emulation or have you got original uh, dev kits? How does it work? Um, it's a complete mixture. Um, we've got, well, we've got an awful lot of original hardware now, probably got 10 or 15 machines in the office just trying to cover all the variations for compatibility testing. Um, but the probably day-to-day, I'm spinning up pretty much using an emulator for sort of a quick rapid testing. But actually, um, I can rapidly push it um, through, like, you know, like a Mega EverDrive, you can push over that. Um, there's also the UMDK bit of kit as well. So there's various tools to get it direct from hardware. Um, and we sort of um, soak test it on the hardware quite regularly. Um, and that's something we're ramping up now. In fact, I've just been ordering about a zillion cables and connectors so we can try and rig up uh, one of all of the major territory and model revisions uh, like in a little array so that when we are testing builds we can just like put our multiple cartridges in and just flick through them checking nothing's gone funny um but yeah it's it's, it's really strange because you get really fast compile times so where we've been doing console games and you build something for an Xbox, PlayStation or Switch and you're waiting like, you know, a few minutes for a, a build to pop out and then get, you know, transfer X hundreds of megs onto the machine. With, with this, you know, I'm compiling in a couple of seconds on average and then uh, dumping it onto the device in a couple of seconds. So it's really fast iterations. Uh, it just obviously you haven't got any of the modern uh, debugging or, uh, you know, there's some of that around, but in, in general, it's, it's a lot harder um, than, than modern platforms to work on. Well, as you mentioned there, it's, it's supported for Steam, Dreamcast, Mega Drive and Switch as well. So it must, is that a bit of a nightmare to maintain all the different builds? Uh, it's a funny thing. Uh, my background is, uh, as I said, uh, cross-platform technology. So I've specialised for well over a decade now in uh, <clears throat> taking something that works on one platform and making it work on another, um, including you know changing languages, uh, programming languages at the same time. So... Um, We've, we actually run two uh, development tracks. So um, Mike is what I would describe personally as a like a creative uh, coder. So he's amazing at getting really good like gameplay. Uh, and I'm not a good, not a good programmer. <laughs> just say. <laughs> he, he always under, no, he always undersells it. He's just not someone that he's not. I wouldn't want Mike sitting there figuring out you know what DMA I'm yeah, amount I'm pushing over the bus, or whatever you know, all these sorts of things. So. Yeah, I think <laughs> so we split really well. So Mike has a PC prototype that he's uh, doing some rapid development on. And then as things lock down, so a bit of gameplay becomes pretty finalized, then we uh, transfer it over um, to the other platforms, so onto the Mega Drive and from there. But at the moment, we've pretty much are focusing on the Mega Drive, get that out of the door, um, because the actual platform porting stage should then be relatively straightforward to the other platforms. Um, we've, we've got it spun up on the other platforms, but they're obviously a bit rough around the edges. One thing I wondered then, actually, when you're talking about kind of playtesting and that too, I mean, you know, if I ever go back to games like Chaos Engine, I'm dreadful at them now. I don't know whether it's just a matter of practice or my reflexes have slowed down a bit, but I can barely get past level one. And often back then it was kind of like you'd have to do the whole game in like three lives. I mean, have you kind of put any more modern elements in this game, like continues maybe, or is it strictly like a, a pretty difficult old school shooter that you've got to practice and learn? Um, I think we've um, currently like adding, because we, we love the arcade element of things as well. So you probably saw a little preview of it in the um, Kickstarter. We've got like a continue system, you know, giving people a chance to keep going, a few credits. Um, and I, I guess we may in, uh, weave in, I'm sure Mike will know more in terms of... Uh, weaving in some mechanism of gaining those throughout the game if you do special things. But, um, yeah, really, uh, yeah, the games back then were hard. And I kind of love that and kind of hate it at the same time when you go back and the, your, your mind imagines how amazing you were at playing this game when you are a teenager and then you find out you're actually really rubbish. Um, so, <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a fine balance, uh, yeah. Well, in terms of the look of the game, Hank, um, how did yeah. you approach this game and what kind of did, did you have in mind for it? Well, it was... Quite obvious, actually. We started off as just, well, interior bits and dark and gritty and horror-like, so that's pretty much my favorite, so there was no problem. But no, the thing is, I never draw concept art while in just the occasion, and it's just in my head. And I just, well, see, what was the first stuff I did for Xeno Crisis? Um, yeah, that was like the, the Outpost tile set, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I think uh, Mike told me just, well, he gave me some hints and some, some well, examples. And in the end, he always writes, well, maybe you got ideas of yourself. And 
most of the time I just well, follow my head and no well, good stuff comes out apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I think from my side of it, um, sort of, I guess I probably handle a lot of the project management of various things, tying things in. I think what we've learned over the years, it's really key to let people have as much free reign in their own sphere and element. Obviously, you've got to control it. Like we can't let crazy or space on the ROM and things like that with the Mega Drive. Um, but in general, it's really important to us that we give the artist complete. You know, you, you do what you feel is right because it flows better. I think that I mean, you can just see from Hank's work is absolutely stunning. You know, so if we'd have said, "Oh, we want it exactly like this and this color," and it, it would have ended up like programmer art, but really good programmer art. <laughs> yeah, that's why everything just also works for this project for me. And it's just, well, it just goes automatically. Just working together with you guys, just everything feels great. Never happens that much, to be honest, in the indie development. Well, at least in the projects I've been working on in the last couple of years. And this is just, well, this is perfect project for me, to be honest. Really, really enjoying this. That's a really special thing to have, you know, a, a team that works really well together. And obviously it, it was uh, kind of seen by the public because the uh, Kickstarter went really well. Were you guys surprised at all by the reaction? <laughs> uh, just a little bit, yeah. <laughs> um, we, we honestly were blown away, especially the first 48 hours. We're literally like, I remember sitting there on Monday, I think it was like 11 o'clock on a Monday morning. Uh, or it was or Monday, or Tuesday, and we were literally like, we haven't done any PR. We've just been because we were really so busy on our previous project. We were like, we need to get this out because otherwise it's going to be, you know, too late before Christmas and whatever. And we're just like, oh, let's just do it. And, and then within like it was almost hours, you know, or minutes. You know, we had, in fact, I think we had our first sale within inside a few minutes. You know, it was just crazy. Um, so and yeah, the the love from the community for it has been uh, really brilliant. Yeah, and some really great ideas as well bubbling up from it. So uh, obviously, you can't we can't uh, cater for everything, but certainly trying to cherry pick the really good ones that come up. One thing I wondered is, how do you go about getting a Mega Drive cartridge made in 2018? I mean, do you kind of go to companies and they give you a bit of a weird look like, hang on, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this was something that um, the Mega Drive for us actually stems back all the way back to a game jam in um, two years ago. Um, I was actually my first game jam. Mike had been like, like doing them for years uh, in the local area. And I really wanted to do one. And I was like, but I, I'm a I'm a like programming technical sort of thing is what makes me buzz. And in a way, I didn't really care what game it was. I just was like, I want to do something on some cool hardware. And I was like, got to do it. I really want to do it because I've done a, quite a bit on sort of the uh, Nintendo hardware previously. Um, sort of like messing around with Homebrew and Game Boy Advance and DS and stuff like that. So um, yeah, I I just wanted to do that at Game Jam. So we made this game uh, Game Jam Fatal Smarties. Uh, had a great time doing it, loved it. And then um, a few months later, it was Mike's 40th, I think. Sorry, Mike, yeah, just giving your age away there. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and so I researched um, the cartridge side a bit more and made him a cartridge for his like birthday with like uh, programmed it on there. And, and then and then thought, you know what? And we actually quite we were surprised by the reaction from the game jam game. We had uh, various uh, blogs and people asking about it um so we knew there was a good like really good scene and community around homebrew and mega drive so then yeah just researched cartridge production and was it possible and yeah realized it, it was there's, there's not very many avenues to sort of uh, hunt it down that are good but you know that there are there are some options out there so prior to the kickstarter we did a lot of work trying to preemptively speak to people but obviously we had no idea of scope i mean we thought we could be just shipping you know a hundred cartridges you know so um now we're going to suppliers and saying we need like a thousand or whatever of these cartridges it's uh, it's changed everything for us you know for us in terms of uh, scale of production but it's all handleable we're actually focusing on it really right now because we don't want to be fixing bugs in the game you know and then worrying that it's going to delay production i want to be able to as smooth as possible have everything here ready to go um sooner rather than later well you mentioned that you you kind of go to events and stuff um attending conventions what's like the public reaction like and what's it like seeing people play your games I've done a few of those now um such as uh play, the play expos and uh, rest uh, insomnia and yeah, it's always great to get your game in front of the public. Uh, we did that with 88 Heroes and Ninja Showdown, and yeah, got some yeah some great feedback. Um, those 
published by Rising Star Games. Um, and yeah, obviously Xeno Crisis, we're going to publish ourselves. So we're hoping at some point to be able to take Xeno Crisis to some of the retro expos. I think Play have a nice retro section, for example. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, just uh, see what the feedback is um, with the, you know, first hand with the retro community. Um, I think also if you're self-publishing as well, you, you have a different feel for the for the products, and also you're making a bit more money out of it, I guess. Um, so yeah, looking forward to that, and it's yeah, it's it's always exciting just uh, to see people playing your game and uh, getting feedback from them and seeing where they managed to crash it, and all that kind of stuff. Well, obviously we know this game's coming out on the Mega Drive um, as well as the the newer platforms, but also the the other kind of retro system it's going to be released on is the Sega Dreamcast. I mean, that's one of our all time favorite consoles. Why the Dreamcast then? I mean, are you guys fond of that system and will there be any kind of differences between the Mega Drive and Dreamcast versions? A lot of love for the uh, Dreamcast, uh, fond memories of that as well in sort of late teens. Yeah, that, <laughs> funny enough, it, these all stem back to very simple decisions. It was Game Jam. It was a year on from Mega Drive. I was like, what am I going to do next? <laughs> so <laughs> I just dusted off the Dreamcast from the roof um, <laughs> in my loft, brought it along. We're always really busy, you know, general day-to-day work trying to grind things out. So I didn't have much prep time. So I rocked up, you know, checked out, downloaded some tools and some pretty cool uh, uh, development scene tools around for the Dreamcast and then promptly realized that pretty much the only way I could get anything onto the Dreamcast was going to be burning CDs. So that made it very difficult at the game jam. <laughs> but it was it was good fun, yeah. And then and really... Uh, it was, a, it was a natural progression. We'd, we'd thought about it before the and, and done quite a bit of uh, uh, insight into it before doing the Kickstarter. It, it, it was effectively our, it was, it was aiming to be our like uh, main extra uh, achievement, but because we didn't really, you know, so a stretch goal, sorry, because we didn't really uh, anticipate hitting uh, our, <clears throat> you know, our target amounts, uh, certainly not within a few days that it was. So, um, yeah, def- definitely a lot of love for the Dreamcast and looking forward to. Uh, getting a release on that as well. I mean, do you think it'll be out on any other platforms? Like, maybe will we see a, an Atari Jaguar version? <laughs> <laughs> We're not with that joy, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I do love trying. It's a challenge for me. I really do love the, the challenge of working on new platforms. I think at this point where we've had so much uh, uh, interest in Xena Crisis now, it's 100% about delivering what we've said we can do. Um, and certainly we'll look to entertain them um, uh, other ideas further down the line but at this moment in time um, there's a lot on our plate already and uh, don't want to overcommit. and, and, and I'm one of these uh, people where oh, we want this sort of team where we want to say things we believe at the time are genuinely achievable um, they sort of I, I'd, if I, I could easily we could easily rattle off things that we could potentially do but doesn't mean that they've been thought out and project planned and you know really penciled in as being done professionally well one thing I love is that you're going to be bringing out um, Xeno Crisis on a pretty special anniversary for the Mega Drive. Yeah, that that was um, that sort of bubbled up. We actually, funny enough, on the Mega Drive front, we're going to launch. Not that we launched in December, obviously last year, but we were actually going to launch the previous November, December. But then um, another game appeared by Matt Phillips, uh, Tanglewood. You might have seen um, yeah. previously for the Mega Drive. He's a great guy. Um, been chatting with him lots. Uh, really active in the community, and. Um, yeah, we, we realised then not, not not good to have a couple of games on Kickstarter that are both Mega Drive, so we sort of uh, backed off uh, at that point. And to be honest, on retrospect, the game idea we had then wasn't quite right. But when it came to uh, Xeno Crisis, uh, we were trying to... We have to give a time when you're going to finish it for um, Kickstarter, and we were sort of researching it and planned it and project planned it, and then I stumbled across that it was 30 years for the Mega Drive, and we're like, ah, oh, this is like too true to be perfect so it's really tight on the development but we still hope and we're going to be doing everything we can to try and hit that time um it's also i don't know if you realize it's 20 years for dreamcast the month later in november oh god so i think i guess back <laughs> day, uh, sega tried to time the dreamcast to be 10 years on from the mega drive um so the two like really marry really nicely well i think we all feel old now <laughs> <laughs> I think that is a wonderful way to celebrate such a, a monumental anniversary, though, and the fact that, you know, you guys are going to be bringing out a game that will push this classic hardware to its limits, and it's still going to be so much fun and an experience that people are going to enjoy in 2018. We, we can't wait to play it. And are people going to be able to get that in their Christmas stocking this year, then? The, the Mega Drive game? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the target dates currently are uh, 
yeah, the 30th anniversary for the Mega Drive. And then I think we've sort of provisionally said January for the other platforms. Mm-hmm. Really just give ourselves some breathing space for those. And it, certainly like with the Switch, um, there's going to be certification to go through as well. So, um, yeah, but that's currently it. But we're going to try and be uh, really transparent on all development over the coming months. Like We did a little update um, recently, but we're going to push every few weeks um, some updates. We've grabbed hold of um, an OSSC um, uh, upscaling board, so we're going to hopefully do some capture from that um, direct from the Mega Drive so we can start publishing little clips of footage and stuff. Fantastic. Well, if people want to keep up to date with the, the, the project and how the progress is going, wh- where can they find you? Zenacrisis.com. I think currently redirects to the Kickstarter, but um, we'll probably ultimately put a little uh, site on the back end of that as well. Um, but yeah, but we're quite active uh, Twitter and Facebook and so on as well. Excellent. Well, we'll put all that in there this week's show notes. Thank you so much for coming on and talking to us, guys. It's been obviously amazing getting your memories, but also the fact that you're doing this fantastic new game in 2018 for these wonderful classic platforms is just incredible. So keep up the good work. Okay, yeah, it's been a pleasure talking to you and uh, be good to come back someday. 